Right. So this talk may be way too short or way too long or possibly <laughs> correct. I don't know. I want to say that among the grades of knowing Jim, I worked at NPL from mid-74 to early 75, working on my PhD thesis. Jim was there then. He and Heather, his wife, had many, many dinner parties. They were extremely sociable. Heather was a fabulous cook. I was lucky enough to get to go to those dinner parties and savor the delicious food and the good company. Uh, and then after I went back to Stanford, Jim started visiting there, so I continued our friendship. So I knew him a long time. Um, this talk has a history that involves Jim teaching at Stanford, okay? That's what I decided to do when I was asked to do this. Here's some context, you've heard this. Jim was mainly at NPL for his career. But he managed to get away and do other things, okay? He worked with Turing on Pilot Ace. He worked in the general computing section after Turing left. Jim was involved with the Pilot Ace project. But he did other things too. So in 58, he taught numerical linear algebra at, in summer schools at Michigan. Cleve joined that group. Then Jean had Jim visit at Stanford for various times in the late 1960s, just as a visitor, not as a teacher. Jim regularly taught at Argonne. I didn't get the dates on that, but he would regularly go there and give courses. But this is the part that's relevant here. Starting in the late 1970s, he regularly came to Stanford. He was officially appointed as a visiting professor in computer science, and he taught one class Beresford Parlett's write-up says it was winter quarter every year, but some of these notes say fall quarter, so I just don't know. And I was inspired when I heard that I could speak at this because I now spend a fair amount of my time teaching linear algebra. I teach numerical computing, but linear algebra is a part of it. And I remembered sitting in on Jim's class and thinking how wonderful he was as a teacher, but also that he had these fantastic notes, these typed notes about elementary linear algebra. And I uh, dealt with this by sending email to people that I could think of that I thought had gone to that class. And I said, did you keep your lecture notes of Wilkinson? I had kept mine, but not well. I have a set of them here. You can see they look like they've been through the wash. <laughs> they, were si they were sitting in a box in my basement. I didn't keep them well, but I wrote to all these people. The two most helpful were Steve Leon, who's here, and um, Pat Worley. They had kept copies of everything. So probably t altogether, there are more than 300 pages of notes that came from Jim, and they're just fantastic. Reading these notes is like reading an exciting novel by a lively narrator, because his personality comes through very strongly, okay? So, they're on two broad topics, linear systems and AX equals B, which I wrote up there, and eigenvalues, okay? So there, he taught two different classes, one of which was mostly about linear systems, one was about eigenvalues. Another treasure that emerged was homework problems. He gave homework problems for these class, which were very challenging. <laughs> I didn't take the class for credit, so I never did these homework problems, but I, <laughs> but I heard about them. <laughs> and he gave solutions. And when I said earlier today that he wrote code, he worked with the teaching assistants to write programs to solve those problems. So the in Programming I think Fortran, do you remember, Fortran. Nick? Was it Fortran? I think it was Fortran. So anyway, having had the privilege now, I've read all the notes as far as I know. A lot of them aren't dated, so you have to sort of deduce which class they went to. But I think it's very clear that Jim continued to rework the material. For those of you who teach, I assume that some of you, and maybe one day all of you, you teach and then you rework the material. You think, well, that didn't work so well. I'm going to present it a different way. So it's really clear that he reworked the material because he was repeating the same classes over and over again. Okay, so what about this talk? 
Now, I could stand here and read you his notes. It would take way more than 25 minutes, and you'd love it because they're really <laughs> interesting. But I thought, well, maybe I could do a little bit of eigenvalues and a little bit of linear systems. I, In I'd the like to see what these homework problems. Well, you're going to at the end <laughs> or, or later. And I'm counting on you to do it. <laughs> But Jim says at the very beginning of the material about eigenvalues, I'm going to motivate the whole of the, oh, everything in blue is a direct quote from Jim, by the way. M motivate the whole of the background theory by consideration of linear, linear differential equations. I thought, OK, I'm not going to do that here. I'm not going to say linear differential equations, blah, 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 blah. So if you're interested in that, you can look at the notes for the eigenvalue problem. So I'm going to focus on this set called Supplementary Notes, CS237B, Winter Quarter 1982. So that's January till March, okay? And let me just say I've read all these and I'm going to summarize it. So in contrast to earlier talks, you will all know everything. You all know about linear systems, right? I'm not going to give you any startling new result. My idea is to present Jim's presentation of them and the way he thought was effective to teach, which has been an inspiration to me. And when I next teach this course, I'm going to try to use some of his ideas. OK. But don't be upset if you think I know about backward error analysis. I know you do. It's OK. So, <laughs> so I'm going to talk about AX equals B. Jim used the notation epsilon in different ways, but it was almost always what he called a modest multiple of machine precision. Some of his phraseology is just wonderful. I don't know many other people would say a modest multiple of machine precision. Now, one of the things that he focuses on, which I don't think most people today think about too much, but I could be wrong, is the size of x. Size of x, we're solving ax equal b. And here's what he says, and I'm quoting the whole thing. If b is random, the probability is very high that x will be on the order of a inverse times norm b, rather than norm b over, a over norm a. Right? You can get either one from the inequality. Most vectors give large solutions. Well, I thought that was an interesting comment. What does he mean by most vectors? Did he do a survey of vectors? You know, we can't ask him. But that's his feeling. On the other hand, if you take a random x, generate b by forming ax, and you get b, probability is high that norm x is of the order of norm b over norm a. And he calls those small, the small x. And then he makes this side comment. Experimenters often construct right-hand sides b from random x to have systems of equations of which they know the exact solutions. And then he says in parentheses, actually, they don't know them anyway. <laughs> and I thought, what does he mean by this? You know, some of these things, I don't know what he meant. All right, so then he considers the correctly rounded version of x. OK, so this is, this is getting into error analysis. So it's x, which is the exact solution, plus w, where w is a small multiple of x norm x. And then he says, <laughs> even this paragon of virtue among approximate solutions, I mean, I thought I could just picture him say, even this paragon of virtue. How many of us would refer to a solution as a paragon of virtue? Not many. Cannot be expected to give a smaller residual than the exact solution of the perturbed system. See, that's a big point with him, right? When you get, you solve a system with Gaussian elimination with partial pivoting, you get a solution that satisfies that equation. And what he's saying is even the paragon of taking the exact solution and perturbing it very slightly will give no better residual. We all know that. OK, so he talks about, and I apologize, Ilsa, he talks a lot about matrix inversion. He talks about, what if we want to compute A inverse? He makes a comment later about it's very helpful when you're assessing the accuracy of the computed solution. But I know there was a little discussion <laughs> earlier about, why are you computing the inverse? Well, Jim would have thought it was important. OK, so then he says the exact inverse is characterized by four properties. 
and he gives the properties, which you can see. And then he says there are four measures that go with them. So we're going to talk about having an approximate inverse. We're going to have kappa be the condition number of A. And then he says, how well are these various things going to do at these measures? Okay. So what's interesting is that it's the condition number keeps coming in, keeps coming in. And he says it obtrudes, which I liked the wording. So here's the first one. It's uh, the perturbed, the exact inverse of a perturbed matrix. Okay. And so then he says it's the exact inverse of a near neighbor. We have test two. We have test one. Test two, it does really well. Th that norm is at less than or equal to epsilon. Test one has the condition number coming in. This is something we're all familiar with. In test three and four, kappa also comes in. Okay. Then there's another possibility. Y2 is A inverse plus W, where W is small. It's a near neighbor of the exact inverse. So by definition, it's good for test one. That means it's <coughs> epsilon, but it comes into test three and four. So he goes through four of these, Y3, which is test four there, and then test fi finally Y4. But he says kappa intrudes into the bound for test three. So you have these four possible approximate inverses, and you have these four tests. Okay. Then he says, what about the correctly rounded inverse? Okay, which is the playing the role of the paragon, right? This is the exact inverse with a small perturbation. <coughs> and you get this, oops, sorry. This, okay? Again, it's got the same kind of perturbation bound. So then he says, fine. That's if we've got an approximate inverse. And then he says, what if we want to compute the explicit inverse? Okay? And he says, this is the way we would usually do it. We'd solve for a column of the approximate inverse. We'd solve AXI equals EI, where EI is the ith coordinate vector. XI would be the ith column of the approximate inverse. And then he says, we expect that we'll get YI to satisfy this relationship here. Okay, again, it's a perturbation thing, but that it will be different for each i. And then Jim says, how good would this be? How good would this be? Right, now we're computing. The, it's not just a theoretical bound. We're, we're computing the inverse. So you write it out, and you do various things, and you see that y, which is what we've done here, the one we computed, does just as well on test three as the inverse of A plus delta A. OK, so we do pretty well on test three. But for test four, something bad happens. Do this, get kappa. There's a kappa squared. So suddenly, you've got a square of the condition number coming into the bound, an extra factor of kappa. So then he says, this is one of my favorite parts of the notes, this bound involving kappa squared calls for further comments. So of course you think, oh, what are those further comments? <laughs> What's coming? But he says it's not realistic in many cases. It's realistic only when the delta AIs are random and uncorrelated. So if you just take A and perturb it with a random perturbation, and then perturb it with another random perturbation that's got no connection with the first one, you will get this kappa squared coming in. Okay? So he says then, if you're computing the columns of the inverse with a stable direct method, this doesn't happen. He says they're not a random set, which I did not know. The rest of you may know this. I did not know it. And he says they're related in such a way that we can expect this norm y a minus i to be of the same size as a y minus i. And then he says the extra factor kappa does not materialize, period. That's the end of that section. So I read that and I thought, why not? Where did it go? What happened? Doesn't explain it. It's very no, frustrating. I, I, 
dying to see a proof of that. <laughs> okay, well, okay. So, he then uh -huh. says, in order to emphasize that the accumulation of errors is not the important feature, Aaron, throughout, he keeps saying, some people say what counts is the accumulation of rounding errors, but that's not it. So he makes that point here. So here's a matrix A. It's got a condition number of 10 to the fourth. Here's A inverse. I don't expect you to absorb all this immediately, but I did this calculation also. His is perfectly correct, of course, but I checked it with MATLAB. Okay. <laughs> So he computes Ay and Ya, and then he tr checks Ay minus I and Ya minus I. Okay, they're n they should be O of epsilon. They're not. They're O of 1, and he said we can't expect them to be small because A inverse is so large. It's going to wreck the residuals of those matrix formulas. Okay, here's the exact inverse of Y. Okay, so this is the inverse of our approximate inverse. And that's what it looks like. And you can see it doesn't look a lot like A. I'm <coughs> sure you've got A committed to memory at this point, <laughs> OK? But it differs by about O of 1. And he says, this is to be expected. And then he makes this comment, however, Y inverse is wrong in rather a strange way. To four significant decimals, Y inverse is 6.6 to 3O times A. It's almost a multiple of A. Now, do you know why? This is another one where he says, we will discuss this later. <laughs> and then he doesn't, <laughs> does not <laughs> discuss it later. So I thought, I've, I've got to check this. <laughs> I think I figured it out. But I thought some of you might, you might say, this is totally well known. I mean, everyone knows this. <laughs> Possibly because we're not now all thinking about the inverse, right? We aren't really going into the inverse. Anyway. Then he says, we're getting a second approximate inverse. We perturb A. We're not using a direct method for linear systems. We're just computing it this way. You get this exact Z. And you see that when you have AZ, again, minus identity, it's about O of 1. But now when you multiply it in the other, remember, this is where the kappa squared came in. Suddenly, it's much bigger, much bigger. So he says, this is because when we compute AZ, we don't mix the different norms. When we take uh, A, Z, Z, A, each element involves one from each column of Y. They mix together, it blows up, okay? So I wrote it down again. You can actually show when you compute an inverse with kappa of one over epsilon and use a stable algorithm, you get the inverse of Y is a, <laughs> a multiple of A. All right. Now let's go on to error analysis. I'm keeping my eye on the thing, Jack. <laughs> OK. He says, and I think it's a quote that you, Aaron, use, that error analysis has concentrated too much on the details of floating point arithmetic. And he says, the important features of the results are really often independent of these details. They would remain the same even if we were considering computation with integers and the old errors were blenders. Now, this is something where he was trying, and in each successive set of notes, it's a different approach. He wanted us to think of error analysis as involving blunders, which he called them, which is this. You have a simple equation, and you put something in it that's wrong. It makes the answer wrong, and you can trace it back to the original. It's exactly. Do you think by old errors was intended to be odd errors? No, no, the errors that you made before. Are now to be reinterpreted as blunders. Okay. Yes, exactly. Okay. So he has this formalism, which he introduces, and makes kind of a production about this, about the discrepancy may arise, but it's merely the sum of all errors made during the computation. There is no interaction. What he says he doesn't like when you use standard error analysis is that it all gets mushed up together. Okay? We do not concern ourselves with what the various quantities would have been if we had produced them exactly. Then he says, this apparently trivial remark is of vital importance. So I paid a lot of attention to that remark. So he says in Gaussian elimination, you have this relationship. He says there are two ways to look at it. So we take 
a M bar, A bar, sub and that's the final reduced form of the matrix is A plus delta. And he says, we can say, this is a perfectly natural, oh, we've computed M bar and A bar N, and in order of to assess our performance, we're looking at M bar, A bar. This is a perfectly natural approach. It pervades the whole of numerical analysis. Alternatively, we can say that if we took A plus delta A and did Gaussian elimination exactly, we'll end up with M bar and A bar. And then he says, which I think is really interesting, historically the second viewpoint is the one that motivated me. He in intrudes himself into these notes and my led to my introduction of the term backward error analysis. Its heuristic value to me was enormous and greatly increased the impact of results at the time, but I doubt whether I would stress it quite so much if I were starting from scratch. And I don't know enough about the history. To, to comment on that. Okay, anyway, here's an example. He's got three equations. He says in the first step, m21 should be 2. He says it's 3, right, the first multiplier. If I attempt to trace the effect of this, if he, if he keeps going, we find that the whole path of the subsequent computation is altered in rather a miserable way. I love that miserable way. <laughs> Instead, it can be said that A21 was wrongly taken as 3 rather than 2. If everything else is done correctly, we have the exact solution of an original system in which A31 was equal to 3. And the computing error is reflected straight back to the original system and is uninfluenced by anything else. That's the approach he likes. Here's one that's less trivial. He says, I illustrate this with two trivial examples. That one I just did was the first trivial example. So you've all seen things like this. Here's a two by two. That's the exact solution. It's very close to one, one. We all do this, I think, in our numerical analysis classes. And he says the first multiplier, M2, was 10 to the fourth exactly. We perform, it's a three-digit decimal arithmetic, by the way. We are sadly adrift. I did this for the dramatic <laughs> thing. The original system of equations is very well conditioned. A poor result is not acceptable. Okay? How can this failure be explained in terms of backward error analysis? So the exact A222 is 1 minus 10 to the fourth because we only have three digit arithmetic. We lose the 1 and we get minus 10 to the fourth. Same with the second component of B. Then he says, these computed values are exactly equal to what they would be if the original A22 and B2 had been zero. So we have computed the exact reduction of this system. And since we didn't make any other errors, we've found the exact solution of this system. Yikes. <laughs> okay. Follows at exactly the same reduced system. And then he says, this is the rationale for pivoting. And then this part I love. The failure occurs, although this equation is a very good equation. It's underlined in the notes. It gives x2 almost exactly. It is the original exact equation that lets us down. The original equations are a miserable pair. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know anyone except Jim who would have said that this was a very good equation or that those original two were a miserable pair. So, all right. I don't think anyone's adopted this kind of thing. I'm considering using it. I'm not totally sure about it. But Jim clearly liked it, and he kept using it in different forms. OK. So actually, I have a minute, and I can quote. So I co-wrote a book, Numerical Linear Algebra and Optimization, in 91. It was dedicated to Jim. This is what we said, okay, which we heard today over and over and over about his contributions, how generous he was, how warm he was, what a great person he was. His formal teachings and lectures were a never-failing source of understanding and inspiration. But the last sentence is one I want to put. A definitive measure of his pedagogical skills was his unsurpassed, I think actually unique, ability to deliver an informative and entertaining talk on error analysis. Mm -hmm. How many other people have you seen give a talk <laughs> on error analysis where everyone is laughing 
you know, I think that's what you see when you get the, this is a miserable pair. <laughs> this is the paragon of solution. Okay, so that's it. Oh, this is a homework problem, but I don't have time to go through it. <laughs> Sorry, Cleve. I've got the slides. You can look at it. Anyway, thank you very much. <coughs> Gaussian illumination with partial pivoting is not stable. We know of examples in which there's terrible, terrible growth. In the right, solution, right, right. But we claim they never happened. In not really never happened. I mean, I thought of that when I read Jim's notes, because he just basically says if you use a good method which satisfies, you know, this, which we know this isn't small when it has growth. But, but I think he's kind of saying, this he is... He never admitted that. Then. Well, he probably admitted it. He certainly knew Not it. In those notes. No. If, I mean, he, he does say that one example that I said was the, non, the second trivial example. He says this example shows the need for pivoting. You know, the one where well, you lose yeah, the things. Because you interchange the two equations. Right, you're, exactly. You're That's right. Shape. That's right, exactly. The, the, the examples we know of which the, there are growth and right. solution. Anyway, I'd say he slides that by. Yeah. <laughs> but I forgive him. <laughs> uh, could I make a comment that one thing these wonderful slides remind me of is that Wilkinson absolutely loved numbers with all the digits and so on. And if you look at his 800-page book, or however long it is, there are four figures, and they're just little sketches. You know, he simply was not a figures guy. But most pages have decimal numbers on them. It's right. astonishing. And I think nobody these days teaches that way, but he made it work. Right, well, that's what partly why I put that example in, because it's got a four-digit numbers in the matrix. Condition numbers 10 to the fourth, yeah. but yet you get a not-too-bad approximate inverse. And then he makes that comment about, you expect to get this. And I thought, OK. He had and one in an, in an earlier set of notes, which was even more badly conditioned. It was 10 to the 6, so you wouldn't get any figures. But he shows that using Gaussian elimination, it comes out OK. I think it's remarkable. Sorry, you can tell that I do. I mean, I wish he would ab be able to teach all of us this stuff. But you see, it's been 40 years since these came out. And a lot of you teach this material, and I don't know how you do it. I have two of the sets of notes here, if you would like to look at them, with post-its by me showing things I wanted to quote.